it's Tony from Cassette Comeback. So this is going to be sort of a typical video that you're going to get from me going forward. And why is that? Well, this cassette is one that I did in one of my earliest videos. In fact, it's here if you want to watch it. Bing! And I thought it was worth a revisit because from the years that I've been using the Chrome Maxima 2 from this generation, in fact, pretty much all Chrome Maximas, I've come to appreciate them for being one of the finest cassettes ever made. It's easily top five for my money. And that's why this is going to be typical of the kind of videos you're going to get from me, because as you notice, there's no tearing open this one. This one is used. Because, well, right, when I used to have a web store, Here's my stash of Chrome Maximas that I had. In fact, this I'd sold quite a few at this point that this picture was made. But as you can see, I had one or two. And I was selling these at one point for £3.99 each, which I thought was a fairly decent price. I mean, when I was buying cassettes, my rule of thumb would be, you know, £1 for a cooking ferric, £2 if there were a ferric but a bit special, £3 for basic type 2s, you know, like essays and stuff like that, especially late ones. Then you could go up to maybe 7 or £8 if they were older vintage classic ones, you know, like maybe Sony uh, UX Pros, etc. And then £10 for metal. And even then I thought, you know, £7, £8 for a cassette was expensive, really. I mean, let's be honest, a lot of us got into this hobby a while ago, years ago, because cassettes were fairly plentiful, they could be got cheap, especially if you were into this hobby maybe 15 years ago where uh, cassettes were being virtually thrown away. You know, you could get good cassettes, you could get good decks, you know, 30, 40 quid would get you a decent deck that worked or maybe one that you need to tweak with it. A few hundred pounds for a top of the line deck that maybe needed a bit of work, but, but now this is how much people are asking for one of these. And yeah, I had a look because I haven't been buying cassettes for a long time. And I had a good look on eBay the other day just to have a see because I went into storage and I found another load of cassettes. You know, look at this lot. You know, I've got them stashed everywhere. I forget where I put them. And I thought, well, okay, I'll, I need to get rid of some of these. I'll, I'll start putting them on eBay. And I couldn't believe the prices. I mean, this 1990 Sony UX. I had hundreds of them and I used to sell them for £2.99 each about four years ago. In fact, even three years ago, back in 2020. Now, I just sold the last ones I had for £14.99 each. And I'm sorry, that's, that's too expensive. I know we love cassettes, I know there's great nostalgia to it, but let's be honest here, boys. You can buy the original source for much, much less than it costs for a, let's be honest, an entry-level Type 2. I mean, metal cassettes, forget about it. You know, it, it just really is bonkers. And so my passion for the hobby is dwindling. I still love cassettes and I still have a great deal of nostalgia, but this is a very niche channel and it will never grow any niche any, any bigger because simply this cassette comeback isn't happening. So if I want to start, you know, looking at new cassettes that I've never looked at before, I'm going to have to start shelling out big money for them. And unfortunately, this channel does not generate enough money per video for me to go and spend 15, 20 quid on a cassette to get 10,000 views and get eight quid back for it. So going forward, I'm going to be going through the cassettes that I've got and either updating them with newer decks than when I had earlier in, in the video's lifetime, or I'm going to be maybe finding some ones that I haven't done any videos on that will be used and then do it on that because uh, uh, there was one guy years ago in, in the groups I was in that he said to everyone, sell them on eBay, that's all it's worth. And they say, oh, I hate this guy, I think he's a robot. Turns out he was right because I see no point really at this moment in time in buying cassettes at eBay prices. They're, it's bonkers. Um, so I'm going to be going through what I've got. So, in this video, I'm going to be using this Chrome Maxima 2, which I say is one of the top five cassettes in my book. And I'm also going to be using my hex deck. Now, if you watch this video here, bing, you can see me unbox it and see that when I got it, it turned up broken. The door wouldn't stay shut. And then after I bodged that repair, 
about a few days later it suddenly lost one channel and eventually I did go through the deck and said oh forget about it and it sat on a on a shelf for a year which um, is a shame because you know it's a unique deck it's very late it's from Arkham who I respect for very good hi-fi stuff and it was probably the last great British cassette deck but it sat there and I couldn't be arsed you know I had a Dragon, I had a ZX9, I had a CR7, a Revox B215 why would I bother trying to get this one working but as it turns out I recently sold the Dragon yes the Dragon has gone and why did I sell the Dragon? well simply being I wasn't using it that much when I had this channel and I needed to legitimize it you know I bought the Dragon I bought you know all the neck decks and the Revox that I wanted and I enjoyed them all but as the saying goes the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom for we never know what is enough until we know what is more than enough and I know what's more than enough because as I've been using tapes less because simply I'm doing less videos I don't have the web store anymore and the prices are going stupid um, it wasn't worth having a dragon sitting there just being used a couple of times a month when I certainly have other great decks as well and certainly that dragon got sold for quite considerably more than I paid for it I mean if I was to buy a dragon nowadays I wouldn't pay what people are asking for dragons I simply do not think it's worth that I mean not to the gentleman who bought it I mean you know you're probably listening to this and thinking what 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 but you know the dragon I sold fully maintained still had all the stuff done by BMW and there's years of service left in it but it simply wasn't worth me having that amount of money invested in something I was hardly using so I'm glad it's gone to who it went to he's going to be doing some digitizing of some very you know special cassettes I believe there he's an ex-DJ and these are loads of cassettes that were recorded live at do's and uh, at nights that he wants to turn digital so we need a great deck for it and that's a perfect deck for it but yes the dragon has gone but never mind because we're going to listen to this and we're going to listen to this on the Arcam and I want people you know I'm going to put like a bit of clickbaity sort of um, title and title screen to this video because I want people to have a listen to here when they say oh cassettes are all rubbish they sound rubbish of how a great cassette in a great deck can sound great that's enough waffling by me let's go and listen to some music So there it is my hex deck but that's finally working and turns out it was well worth the effort so before I begin recording if you haven't watched that video which I linked in the earlier part just to to go on a bit about chrome cassettes if you're new to this now chrome has become the uh the stereotypical word for a type 2 cassette you know just like hoover has become the stereotypical word for a vacuum cleaner the first type 2 cassettes were chrome chrome pigment and they were developed by dupont and basf also created the chrome pigment now the chrome pigment was an expensive pigment to make and as such when it came to selling it it was a high highly priced object or more importantly it would cost even more for you to be able to make the facilities to make your own chrome pigment and that's why at the start people like Sony did make pure chrome cassettes however after a while they decided they were going to make a new formulation for type 2 which turned out to be cobalt dope ferric so that's basically type 1 cassettes but doped with cobalt to give them better uh, coercivity so as such Japanese decks going forward the internal calibration the bias were calibrated for type 2 to, to cobalt dope ferric type 2 and not to chrome pigment type 2 so that's why for example when I used to buy BASF chrome in the 80s I only bought them once tried them in my Japanese low-end deck and guess what they sounded muddy they sounded quiet and they didn't sound good so I didn't buy them again but I didn't know in them days the reason was is because Japanese decks were not calibrated to handle 
a pure chrome type 2. Most European decks, and when I say European, I mean this is Arkham, English, late, but like your Bic, your Jewels, etc., your Tanbergs, they could handle chrome pigment cassettes much better than, for example, Japanese made decks. Because the only other people that really made pure chrome tape were SKC from Korea. But even then, they cobalt dope the chrome so that it could handle a bit more level because you shouldn't record a chrome cassette at more than zero db and the reason being is that they are naturally low hiss much less hiss than a ferrocobalt type 2 but a ferrocobalt type 2 in order to negate the hiss you would record them hotter you'd call them at plus four plus six etc and then you turn your amplifier down so it sounded just as loud but you couldn't hear the background hiss was on a chrome you record them at zero because you didn't need to record them any higher because they were just inherently low hiss and plus they're distorted if you took them much higher but you didn't need to but anyhow i digress so you've got to be careful what decks you can use a pure chrome type 2 in uh, you usually are better off with a deck which has some sort of calibration facilities you put it into a japanese made deck which has no calibration facilities and it, it's not going to sound good put it in a deck which has auto calibration it'll try sometimes fail sometimes won't and again decks with manual calibration give it a do not all of them can but the best decks can i mean for example all my nakamichis they love pure chrome not a problem and this art can be in english it loves pure chrome too so let me just put this in and calibrate it up so the calibration on this is very simple it's not as complicated as the Nakamichi's basically it already knows it's a type 2 I really wish there was some way that it would show the tape so I know that it's actually recognized a tape type but it has so we just fast forward the tape on a bit right I press this cal tone button and it says it's on now I record and we've got two levels calibration and bias best thing to do is to bring the calibration up so this is the level basically okay so we've got the level nice and firm we're a bit over biased so let's take some of the bias off but by adding some let's have a look that sounds wrong but do it this way okay we've got the bias about spot on let's turn the calibration back take a bit more of the bias and there we've pretty much got the tape calibrated on and it's it's not massively i mean the point in this way in this way so it's not massively like i've had to twist it all the way around to get it there this deck was designed obviously to take a pure chrome so let's stop it there so this uh tune i'm going to use now because like i say i can't use a real tune which is a shame because i'd like to have ran jungle bill by yellow or something through this which is a wonderfully stereo well made oh wonderful track i love yellow but i can't use that so i'm going to use something which is blues yeah it's got lots of piano in it lots of guitar it's quite quiet so rather than just use my usual pumping you know sort of dance electronic music let's use something subtle and quiet so we can have a proper listen to how good a cassette can really sound. I'm not using any Dolby because you don't need to and I don't want to, but this combination of deck and this combination of cassette, I, I, if it gets better, my ears can't tell. Simple as that. And perception is more important than reality. So let's get this recording and you can have a listen for yourself. Sorry, I must say, this is called Hurt So Good Blues.
Uh, no track fade on this deck, you know, you have to do it the old fashioned manual method, but I think you'll agree that too is a hell of a combo. It really is. I mean, it's beautiful and delicate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it's not identical, but it never is. But that's the beauty of it. You see, you can't compare to the source once it's been recorded. Once it's been recorded, it either sounds good or it doesn't. And this sounds fantastic. So, I mean, I, I hate the phrase, you know, oh, it's a dragon killer. It's not. It, it doesn't work like that. The dragon has a reputation it's got, not purely based on its components and its specs. You know, many modern supercars, you know, they, they, they can outperform a McLaren F1. The faster, the lighter, they've got better systems in them. But it's the whole package that makes the McLaren F1, I believe, the greatest road going car ever. And it doesn't matter if other cars are faster or lighter or better. Look, it doesn't matter. It's a package. So I'm not going to say this is a dragon killer because nothing is. A dragon's a dragon and that's it. Stop trying to kill it. If you hate it that much, buy one, then you'll enjoy it. But anyway, the point is, this is a deck that a lot of people say, oh, that deck, oh, that, it's, it's, it's just a denim mech. I mean, yeah, look at this picture I took when I was actually fixing this and the, the, the front came off. It is. It's purely a mech from a Denon uh, DRM800A, I think it is, with the heads. But that negates all the wonderful circuitry behind it. You know, it's got six separate boards for the Dolby circuits in this. It's got a separate power supply, which has got the biggest transformer I've ever seen. It's got separate boards for the interface, separate boards for all the audio hardware. It's more than just the mech and the heads, because the Arkham engineers went mad at the back end, making their dream deck. And as you just heard there, this I think it's one of the best sounding decks ever. And like I say, I can speak as somebody that's had a Revox B215, a Dragon, still has a CR7, still has a ZX9. No, I've never had a Tamburg and I will never have a Tamburg, but I don't care because this cassette deck, every cassette I've thrown at it, even the cheapest type one, it's done a fantastic job that sounds brilliant. And when you put in a cassette like this, yeah. You, you, you've got about as good as cassettes get in my book. And anyone who says that that sounds crap is either lying or their ears don't work. So that's it for that video. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if I come across some more interesting stuff in my stashes while I'm looking, we'll have a listen to some more cassettes. But other than that, happy taking, uh, happy taping. Yes, happy taping. That's what I wanted to say. Happy expensive taping, as it turns out to be lately. You know, watch you keep an eye on those pennies, boys and girls. But other than that, take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. The truth.